Okay, I'm glad we got people to hear to listen to me talk about intellectual property. Um, this has been a pet thing of mine for a number of years, uh, a backdoor thing, because I'd work out in my spare time when I wasn't talking about the Fed or Social Security or other such things. So it's great to have a chance to talk about it and drag a few other people along to listen. Um, I'll just say that I think this is incredibly important and growing in importance because, as you'll see in a moment, I mean, it comes up in the context of prescription drugs. That's probably where it is the most important, both in absolute dollar amount, but it's, it's people's lives, and it's a huge, huge thing. But it comes up in all sorts of other contexts where it might be less important. It's not life or death, but it comes up in software. It comes up in trying to enforce copyright with the Internet. Um, it's, it's a huge, huge issue. So I really think we need some fundamental rethinking on it, so it's great to have some people try this out on. So I really appreciate your patience, and we're giving you wine and cheese afterwards to reward you for sitting through it. So, Okay. All right, uh, I want to start just outlining patents and copyrights, what they are, why we have them, how they end up there. Um, then going through the basic economics of patents and copyrights, and I'm going to do it using the example of software first and foremost just because we have the charts, so that's why I'm using software as, not, as opposed to not other items. Um, then I will go through patents and prescription drugs. Again, I do think that is the case where the issue of the, the current system of intellectual property um, is the most problematic, causes the biggest problems. Um, then I'll go through copyrights in the Internet age. I think copyrights perhaps have always been a problem, but they're a much, much bigger problem when you have the Internet. And then a little bit about alternatives to patents and alternatives and copyrights, because, again, what my point is going to be that patents and copyrights do serve a purpose. We all know that. I'll go through that. Um, but the point is there are alternatives, so it's not the end of the story you know, what will we do without them? Well, that's a question. What would we do without them? And I want to try at least throw out some provisional answers to that. Okay, first, before I go on to the next chart, just what are they, why we have them? I mean, what they are, they're monopolies. Let's be clear what patents and copyrights are. They're forms of protection, okay? Uh, just to be clear on where they came from, you know, I sometimes in debate with, debates with people, and I think they think these were somehow part of the Holy Grail, you know, that God gave them to us or something, you know. You know, patents and copyrights come from the medieval the feudal guild system, um, that where they, their origins are is that masters would have a patent that would prevent their, their apprentices from, or journeymen from coming there and stealing their techniques and then going somewhere else. That's the origins of them. It's a feudal guild system. So the idea that this is somehow part of the free market, no, this is actually completely antithetical to a free market. This is from the feudal guild system. And the idea is that if I have a patent on something, the government is giving me a monopoly, same thing for copyright, they're giving me a monopoly for a period of time, and what that means is I get to have someone arrested if they produce whatever I'm talking about, whatever I have the patent on or whatever the copyright in, without my permission. Okay, it's, it's completely antithetical to a free market. Okay, it's, it's the government is going to arrest people for engaging in economic activity. I have a patent on a prescription drug. Okay, someone else is going to produce the generic version of it. I haven't given them permission. So I call up the cops and say, okay, bust them, arrest them, you know. I mean, of course, it goes through sequence before that. First they pay fines, we go to court, this and that. But if at the end of the day they keep trying to produce their drug in competition with me, they end up in jail for it. Okay, so it's completely antithetical to a free market. Why do we have it? Well, we have it to give me incentive. The government wants me to have incentive to develop new drugs. I'm Pfizer, and I am spending billions of dollars. That's true. They do spend billions of dollars to research prescription drugs. So they want me to have incentive to develop a new drug for heart disease, a new drug for cancer. So what they're telling me is, okay, go out and develop a new drug for heart disease. Go out and develop a new drug for cancer. And if you do that, you're going to get a patent. We'll give you a monopoly. We'll enforce it for you. You'll have that for 20 years in the case of prescription drugs. And then you can make lots of money, and you'll be richly rewarded for doing this research. So what it is, it's a way in which the government provides incentives for people. They give you a monopoly for a period of time. It's the same story with copyrights. It's a little different issues there, but basically the same story. They give someone a monopoly for a period of time to make a movie, write a book. We're going to give you a reward on that. The reward is we'll arrest anyone who produces it in competition with you. And it gives you a chance to make back, you know, your time commitment, your investment, whatever it might be. So it's a form of government interference in the market. In fact, the government comes in there and says, we'll give you a prize. It, that will give you incentive to do, do this work, that work that we find socially useful. Okay, so the idea that it's the market, no, it's quite deliberately a government intervention into the market. And the way I always frame the discussion is, is it the best form of intervention? Okay, so we're not arguing about a market or not market. 
arguing about what is the best way to provide incentives for people to research prescription drugs, for people to develop new software, to write books, make movies. We want to know what's the best way the government provide incentives because the market won't do it. Anyone who supports this has already told you they don't want the market solution. They want the government. The question is what do we want the government to do? Okay. Next graph is the basic economics. I know you can't see this very well, but that's to make a point in part. Policy economics of protectionism, I always refer to copyrights or patents as a form of protectionism because they are. You know, I get a lot of people get really upset at that because, you know, we're supposed to be, we aren't Neanderthals. The Neanderthals want to protect steel or textiles. They're really dumb, stupid people that, you know, they make textiles for 10 bucks an hour because they aren't smart like us and write editorials for the Washington Post or New York Times like Thomas Friedman. So they have to do these stupid menial jobs. And the only way they could ever get by is government protection. So we're all smart, intelligent people, so we know that protectionists are stupid Neanderthals. Okay, well, there's an economics around protectionism that all economists, or I should say all economists, anyone who's taken intro econ has seen it because all economists beat it into your heads. You're supposed to think these people are stupid Neanderthals because protectionism is inefficient. You know, having a tariff on, on shirts, I think that's what I have here, it's too small to read, but deadweight loss to a $2 tariff on a $20 shirt. Yes, having protection on shirts is inefficient, okay? Well, there's an economics around that, which I'll go through in a moment, but you could use the exact same economics to analyze protection in the form of copyrights or, tariff or, or, or patent protection. Okay, so what are the economics of that? You can't see this very well, but the story here is that we have our $20 shirt. That's what we'd sell for. We import the shirt from, you know, uh, 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 from Thailand or Malaysia, wherever it is they're producing shirts these days. It would sell for $20 if the government would just be smart and leave things alone and that's how much we'd be able to get the shirt for. But because, you know, the powerful textile unions, you know, beat up the government and our members of Congress can't stand up to those people, they allow them to put a $2 tariff barrier on it. Okay, so what happens? Instead of the shirt selling for $20, it sells for $22. Okay, so what happens in that case? Well, a lot of people in the U.S. that otherwise would have gotten $20 for the shirt, they're getting $22 for the shirt. Okay, what is that? Well, that's a transfer from us. We're going out and paying 22 bucks for the shirts. It's a transfer that people are selling shirts. So some of that is the profits of the textile makers. Some of it is the workers who get 10 bucks an hour. Might otherwise, you know, get 8 bucks an hour. You know, so some of it goes to the workers. That's a transfer. It's not a deadweight loss. It's a transfer. The deadweight loss is a tiny little thing that you can't see here. But, you know, if I were trying to tell you how bad protectionism is, it would be a much bigger triangle. And I would go, okay, there's all these people that would be willing to buy this shirt at 20 bucks. They're not willing to buy it at 22. Okay, maybe they're willing to buy it at 21. You know, okay, but they're not going to buy it at 22. So this is what we refer to as the dead weight loss, that all these people have been really happy buying that shirt for 20 bucks. They maybe even want to pay 21, but now that they have to pay 22, they go, no, I'm just going to wear the same old shirt I've always been wearing. Okay, so there's all these people who are made really unhappy by the fact that they have to pay $22 for the shirt rather than 20. So for some number of people, this number here, you know, that difference there, there's some number of people would have bought the shirt for 20. They don't buy it for 22. Some of them lost, in effect, two dollars of benefit because they would have been willing to pay twenty dollars for it, um, you know, but or twenty dollars and one cent for it. But now it's at 22, so they lost two dollars of benefit. Um, some of them lost very little because you know they would pay 20, 21.99, but it's 22, so they lost one penny of benefit. It's not a big deal in that case. Just say an average, they lost one dollar of benefit, you know. So whatever number of people this is, they lost one dollar of benefit on average. Some lost two dollars or 1.99, and some lost you know, one cent. Okay, so that's the story of protectionism. That's why we think it's really bad. On the one hand, there's this transfer, you know, which, you know, as good economists would say, well, is that good or bad? It's a transfer. It's a redistribution. It's not inefficient. It's better that, you know, I have the consumer have it than the textile worker has it. Well, that's kind of a moral question, but as economists, we're supposed to get really upset about the inefficiency. You know, so all these people that would have bought it at $20, but they aren't willing to buy it at 22 Okay, now let's go to the software market. Okay, what's the loss to the fact that, let's say this is Windows operating system. Okay, I don't know exactly what it sells for, but we picked 100 bucks. You know, probably a ballpark number in terms of what they sell it for, what they'll charge the computer company to put it on your system. Somewhere around 100 bucks, that's really not exactly right. Okay, what does it sell for if the government doesn't arrest me for making copies of Windows? It sells for zero. It's costless. Okay, maybe someone wants to put something 000.00 and put a 1 at the end there. You know, there's some minute cost to electricity involved or whatever. But it's basically costless. Okay, so what is the efficiency loss with Windows? Okay, well, there's a lot of people that would have been willing to pay, you know, a dollar for Windows, you know, five bucks for Windows, ten bucks for Windows, fifty bucks for Windows. All those people don't get it. 
Okay, because they're not willing to pay $100 for Windows. Okay, so the efficiency loss with Windows, well, could it be as much as $100? There's someone willing to pay $99.99, they're not willing to pay $100, so they don't get it. Okay, so in principle, they could have had a gain of $99.99 if we just got the government out of the market and let anyone who wanted to make Windows, you know, make copies of it, do it. You know, just got the government out, don't arrest people for it. That could be the gain, but the government's in there, so, you know, that's how much we lose by it. Okay, and obviously a lot more people are likely to fall in this gap between the zero and a hundred. These are totally arbitrary numbers, by the way. I mean, any scale doesn't really matter. But the point is that obviously going to be a lot more people who might fall in this gap between being willing to pay, you know, one cent for Windows, as opposed to being willing to pay more than a hundred dollars. There's a lot going to be a lot more people in that gap than you know, going from twenty dollars to twenty-two dollars with the shirt. Okay, but we can analyze this exactly the same way. It's the exact same methodology. The losses from copyrights or patents are exactly the same. We can think of them exactly the same way, except that the numbers are likely to be hugely larger. With patents, with, with um, most forms of protection these days, at least in the United States, it's a little higher if we're talking about a developing country. But in the United States, it's pretty rare that you would talk about a, a tariff barrier or a trade barrier raising the price of a, of a good by more than 15 or 20 percent. I mean, there, there might be some examples, but, you know, but that would be the exception. Whereas with copyrights and patents, you could see, well, certainly in the case of copyrights with software, we have goods that, in principle, we get at no cost that end up actually being fairly expensive. Okay, so it's the same analysis, but the numbers would be an awful lot bigger. I'm moving around too much. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. I will stop moving around so much. Okay, um, okay, so, okay, and it, so that's the efficiency loss. Next point is monopoly rents. Again, if we were giving the intro course in, in, protectionism and we'd say how bad it is, it's not only bad because you have the inefficiency, but because you have you have these monopoly rents that, you know, we're give, we have the trade barrier, we have the people who are getting 22 bucks for their shirts when really they should only get 20, that they start paying money to politicians, they pay money to lobbyists. Okay, they have various forms of monopoly rents that are, again, a waste to society. Well, you have the same thing in the case of, uh, of patents and copyrights. I'll go through that. And I think in a lot of ways that's probably a bigger issue in many cases. The monopoly rents, the, the, the rent-seeking behavior is a bigger issue than the deadweight loss associated with the higher prices. Okay, so I'll come back to that. But again, the, the key point here is that in principle we could think of patents and copyrights, we could analyze them in exactly the same way we would trade protection. And in fact, we should analyze them. I mean, it's really not a debatable issue. If I got an economist who said that patents are great, copyrights are great, if they are honest, they have to say this is exactly how you would analyze them, at least the cost. Okay, we'll come back and talk about the benefits. Okay, the next point, just how we think about this, there, there's a tendency to talk about patents and copyrights I was referring to a moment ago as, as being rights, and I don't know how many times I've had this argument with people, and they go, well, they're in the Constitution. So, of course, I had to take the opportunity to look up in the Constitution. What does it say about patents and copyrights in the Constitution? Well, if you look in the Constitution, you aren't going to find it in the Bill of Rights. It's not like the right to free speech or religion or assembly or, you know, right to a fair trial. Where you find it is in Section 8, Clause 8. These, this is enumerating the powers of Congress. So this is saying things like, Congress shall have the power to impose taxes. Okay, so what's one of the powers of Congress? To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Okay, that's what it says about patents and copyrights. Okay, it's explicitly a policy that Congress has the option to pursue. They aren't obligated to pursue it. This is one of the powers that Congress has the option to pursue. They're no more obligated to pursue it than they are to have taxes. Okay, you know, suppose Congress decided we could run the country, we don't need taxes, we have enough money, you know, we saved it up or whatever, we don't need any taxes. No one would have a case that they could go to court and say, oh, the Constitution says the Congress has to tax. I mean, it's absurd. Okay, the exact same thing with copyrights and patents. What it says is one of the powers of Congress is that if they think it's necessary and appropriate to promote science, to promote arts, that you have copyrights and patents. That's one of the things they could do, totally within their option not to do it. Okay, so just emphasizing that point, they're the mechanism to advance a public policy goal. Okay, so that's how you have to think about it. I mean, you're welcome to think about it any way you like, but that's how at least I would put it forward, that you know, patents and copyrights are one way we could, we could look to promote innovation, creativity, artistic work. They're not the only way, they're one way, and the question we have to ask is, are they the best way?
Okay, prescription drugs. Okay, some basic numbers here. Um, 220 billion, these come from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Research, so if you want to know where I'm coming up with numbers here, I'll try to be clear where I'm getting these numbers. Um, according to Center for, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Research, we're going to spend roughly $220 billion on prescription drugs in, in, in uh, calendar year 2005. That's a projection. We don't know exactly what we'll spend. Um, competitive price. What, what do I mean by competitive price? Suppose we snapped our fingers. No one's got a patent. Okay, so anyone who wants to could produce, you know, Vioxx and, you know, whatever other drug. We could all buy generics. No patents. You know, we just buy them at generic prices. It would cost us roughly $70 billion. Where am I getting that from? We have data on what the average price of a generic drug is, and it's about 30% of the price of an average brand drug. Okay, so it's a ballpark number, but, you know, this is a very large sample because we have it for basically all the prescriptions being filled. So it's a very large sample. It's a whole, you know, basically everything in the country. And, you know, we could say it's roughly 30% of the price. So what does that mean? If, you know, if we snapped our fingers, we got rid of drug patents in the United States tomorrow, we'd have savings of roughly $150 billion a year. Okay, good chunk of good chunk of money. That's uh, you know our GDP is around 12 trillion, so you're talking about 1.3 percent GDP. Okay, real money, real money. I think in anyone's book. Um, according to the industry, they they say that they spend 40 billion a year on research domestically. I'm saying claims because they put out data. You know, there's a the industry as an organization, uh, pharma, pharmaceutical um, research and manufacturers. I'm mangling it, but it's you know I mean, you've probably seen pharma, so it's it's their data. It's the industry trade group. I don't know that they're lying, but I just don't know that they're telling the truth either. So, you know, so, so they claim $40 billion. So, in other words, we're spending $150 billion in additional money to pay for $40 billion in research. I'll come back, but those are sort of first numbers to start with. So we pay $150 billion in higher drug prices to pay, according to the industry, pay for to pay for $40 billion in research every year. Okay, and... This is a big deal today, but it's getting to be a much, much bigger deal because we're spending the, the amount, the rate at which we're increasing spending on prescription drugs is about 10% a year. So according to Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, we're projected to be spending over $500 billion a year on prescription drugs. That's a single year, so I'm not adding that up. That's a single year. 2014, they project we'll be spending over $500 billion. That's in 2014 dollars. I haven't brought them today's dollars. And roughly half will be paid by the public sector. So roughly $250 billion of that is projected to be paid by mostly the federal government at that point, but there are also some state local contributions through Medicaid and also paying for their state employees, state and local employees. Okay, so what are the distortions created by prescription drugs? Well, first off, drugs are expensive. Okay, um, the, you know, a good example here is a, a number of the AIDS drugs, the antiretrovirals. When they first came out, a number of these uh, years prescription was on the order of 10,000. In fact, some were even more, 12, 15,000. You have generic producers in India, CIPLA is the most famous, that are producing drugs. They're world-class standards. They submit these to, to, to testing by, you know, WHO and other agencies, and they pass. They're, world, you know, they're the same quality that you'll get here. So it's not you're getting an inferior drug that's diluted with, you know, whatever you might think they'd put in there. This is world-class standards, and they charge you 200 bucks. Okay, so we're talking about price reductions in some cases. These are extreme cases, but, you know, on the order of 98%. Now, there's obviously a lot of people in the world that could afford a drug at $200 who cannot afford it at $10,000. Okay, and also I realize even $200, if we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa, these are very, very poor people. They might not be able to afford $200, but to talk about paying for, you know, millions of AIDS victims in sub-Saharan Africa at $200 a pop, well, that's, that's a doable task. I mean, you know, the U.S., Europe, we could come up with that money. We can't to 10000 I mean, that's, we're, we're not going to get that money. So, you know, there's other obstacles for treating people with AIDS. I don't mean to say it's a whole story, but, you know, it's a very, very different picture. So you're talking about life and death. AIDS is an extreme case. This happens with all sorts of other drugs. If you have patent protection, people can't afford it. If they were sold in a competitive market, a lot of drugs would suddenly become affordable. Okay. Other issues, less important, but nonetheless important, price discrimination, gaming. You go to a lot of people who, you know, recognize the problem that, you know, people in sub-Saharan Africa, poor people in the rich countries can't afford it, and they say, well, what we should do is have it so that, you know, the people who are wealthy, you know, they have good insurance, they're going to pay 10000 but then we'll have it for the people who, you know, can't afford it, they'll pay 200 Well, you know, you'd be an economist on this. I love how economists don't like to be economists when they talk about these things. 
You know, you go, well, what's going to happen? I, they're trying to charge me 10000 because I'm a rich person, but I see they're getting over there for 200 bucks. So I'm a smart guy, so I figure out a way that I can get the 200 buck one. So they go, oh, no, no, then we're going to find real clever ways that keep you from doing it. So guess what? We spend an awful lot of money trying to have this price discrimination so that they can get the 10000 out of me while the other people, the poor people, get for 200 And it's nuts. It's totally nuts. It's totally nuts in this country. I mean, I, I can't tell you had some first-hand experience I won't go into, but, you know, the things that people have to go through to, you know, the insurance companies obviously would rather pay the 200 bucks. Most of us pay for our drugs through insurance companies if we have the money to have good insurance. So the things that the insurance companies go through to try and restrict prices um, and then the things that doctors and patients do to get around them or pharmacies, it is a waste of everyone's time. So if economists acted like economists, rather than jumping up and down about the tariff barriers and shirts or whatever it might be, they would jump up and down about this stuff because it's a huge deal. Um, the third thing that you get from, from these high prices, counterfeiting. Um, again, you know, when they teach this in uh, Econ 101, you know, if you, if you have government intervention in markets so you raise the price above the competitive market price, what are you going to have happen? Well, you'll have counterfeiters. You'll have people who try to take advantage of that. And that's, of course, what you have with prescription drugs. The most obvious form of counterfeiting or unauthorized sales, I should use a more neutral term, in, in the case of prescription drugs, people get in drugs from other countries. You know, and sometimes they're from Canada, they're from Europe, Australia, where they have the same standards as the U.S. So there's no obvious problem with that. There might be some issues about labeling or whatever, but basically that's fine. But sometimes people might get from developing countries where, you know, it's more questionable quality. Okay, so again, if you had economists acting like economists, they would be very concerned about this because it's a predictable market response. We're trying to sell these things for 10000 when it costs 200 a year to make them. Okay, it's a predictable response. Okay, well, that's the sort of distortions created by, you know, the excessive price, but this is in the monopoly rent area. Um, what are the sort of perverse incentives that you get from having monopoly rents? Well, the first one is copycat drugs. Okay, well, what happens if I have the, the first breakthrough drug, you know, in, in uh, calcium, channel, uh, calcium channel blockers, you know, a drug for treating heart disease? Well, I have a breakthrough drug in that. I can make a lot of money on it. Well, what's the incentive for the other drug companies? Well, they want to get in on my fortune. Okay, they don't care about producing, you know, a better drug. They just see that I'm walking away with, you know, I'm Pfizer and I'm making $3 billion a year on Claritin. So they want to come in there with their new allergy drug. They're going to compete with me. Now, if we have monopolies, then it's good. You know, two drugs are better than one drug because there'll be, you know, some competition. If we have three drugs, there'll be a little more competition. But from a social standpoint, if we're selling at the free market price, no one would spend any money, or at least they'd spend very little, trying to research these copycat drugs. Now, how much is spent on researching copycat drugs? Well, the FDA tells us that roughly three-quarters of the drugs they approve fall in this copycat category. They're not qualitative breakthroughs. They duplicate what existing drugs already do. And the industry was good enough to tell us that it cost them about 90% as much to research a copycat drug as to research a breakthrough drug. Okay, they told it to us in a different context, but they told it to us nonetheless. So what does that tell us? That tells us that two-thirds of what they spend on their research is going for researching copycat drugs. Okay, now if we go back to the numbers I had before, they told us they spend $40 billion a year researching prescription drugs. They tell us, or we could back that out, that two-thirds of their money is spent researching copycats. Well, that means one-third, about $14 billion a year, is spent researching breakthrough drugs. Well, we're spending $150 billion a year in higher drug prices to pay for that $14 billion in research on breakthrough drugs. So, in other words, we're spending more than $10 in higher drug prices for every dollar that they spend researching breakthrough drugs. Okay, in my book, at least, not a great deal. Um, the next point, the secrecy one. Um, well, what's the industry there for? They're not there to advance the science. I'm not saying they're bad people or anything, but, you know, if you're at Pfizer and, you know, you go, hey, I just had this great idea and I called someone over at one of the other manufacturers and they figured out how they could, you know, have this thing, this new drug that will extend the life of cancer patients by 20 years. And I'll get fired real quick because they're going to make the money on it, not Pfizer. Um, Pfizer wants people to get the information out that they need to get out to get their drugs approved. So they need information. They need to file information to get a patent. They need to file information about their tests to get the FDA to approve their drug. They don't gratuitously make information available. And if you do make it available from Pfizer, you get fired. Everyone signs confidentiality agreement. You don't to get any information out that they don't want out. Well, all of us believe, at least everyone I know, that research works best when it's open, and in this case, it's clearly not open. It's very tightly sealed. Um, I was at a conference this summer. There was a woman from the Food and Drug Administration who was talking about how 
they had someone, uh, major drug companies, you can tell us more on this, but a major drug company was bringing in, you know, these clinical trials on this drug, and she's just sitting there looking at them. She knew it was going to fail because someone else had done the same thing, but she couldn't say anything about it. She was legally prohibited from saying a word about it. So you had this incredible waste of effort. You know, if the information were public, they'd just be able to say, hey, that doesn't work. You know, why waste our time? But it's secret, okay, and that's by the nature of the system. Okay, well, that's, you know, one aspect of it. It gets more serious if you have negative research findings. You have a really big incentive. Vioxx is one that was in the news. If you read the, the Times, it has very good coverage on this issue. If you read the Times, uh, you know, if you read it regularly, I, I suspect you won't have a month go by where you don't have a case where there's a drug company or a maker of uh, medical devices that is caught co concealing information that reflects badly on their product. What are the incentives? This is one of these things. Where the hell are economists? Why aren't they thinking like economists? What are the incentives for Pfizer with Vioxx when they find out that, oh, well, you know, for some heart patients that might be a bad thing? Okay, what's their incentive? Well, if they think they could get away with this and never get caught, their incentive is to keep it secret. They have a billion dollars. You're giving them billions of dollars a year by keeping that secret. If they think they could do it without getting caught. Now, obviously, if they think they're going to get caught, then they'll make it public because they don't want to pay big penalties in lawsuits. But if they think somehow they can get away with keeping it secret, then their incentive we're economists. We believe people respond to incentives. They'll keep it secret. And there's a lot of cases where clearly they've done that. Okay, another aspect about the research, um, uh, uh, perverse incentives. They have no incentive to, preserve, to, to research non-patentable cures. And I'm not a, a, a doctor. I'm not a medical uh, biologist. But, you know, just our common sense would tell you that, you know, in some cases you're looking for a prescription drug that's going to be the best cure, best treatment. Some cases, maybe nutrition is more important, maybe exercise, maybe some combination, maybe there's environmental problems. Well, if you're at Pfizer and you're doing the research and guess what, it turns out if you just got everyone to eat more broccoli, you know, that would be more effective than, well, you're not going to make a point of pursuing that. You'll tell your boss, and I'll go, that's very good, let's work on something else. You know, now maybe you're public spirited and you'll do the research on your own time and, you know, but Pfizer's not going to pay you to do that. Okay, that's not what they're there for. So again, this gets back to how do you have research advance most quickly? You know, well, if all this research were public, if you don't discriminate between, oh, this is something I can get a patent on, this is something I can't get a patent on, I mean, someone at NIH might do that. They might do it on the public, you know, public buck. But, you know, it, you have this segregation. Over here, there's research that's being done on patent support. Over here, public support. And the contact between them might be very limited. Okay, so that has to slow research progress. Um, lastly, again, you know, economists yelling about monopoly rents. Well, um, uh, you know, lobbying for public payments for drugs, legal harassment, generics. This goes on all the time. I mean, you, you all have been around for the Medicare prescription drug benefit that was passed a few years ago. I mean, the, the drug industry designed that. I mean, it's an absolutely nutty disaster that, you know, they're realizing now as people are signing up for it, no rational person was sat down, how can we best design a prescription drug benefit? The industry wanted to design one that ensured they make lots of money. So they had this absolutely nutty thing that their lobbyists got passed because they give a lot of money to members of Congress who voted for it, you know, and President Bush. Um, they do this state by state. Again, Times has some very good coverage. Of about a year ago, they had an article about how they go around state by state. You know, you have different Medicaid budgets. This will change now with the prescription drug benefit, and this, a lot of this comes under the federal budget. But it used to be a lot of these things were decided state by state. So they go to Virginia, they go to Ohio, they go to California, and they go, you really should pay for our expensive drug. And they get their lobbyists out there, and they make their case. They spend a lot and lot of money on that. The legal harassment generics, as I said, uh, patents only supposed to be there for a limited period of time, 20 years. It's absolutely standard. You know, I'm a generic producer. I see that the patent on Claritin is about to come off, so I'm ready to get into the market. And they start coming up with ridiculous patents, you know, that almost certainly are illegal. Okay, I mean, uh, they aren't illegal. They have no legal standing. But I have to spend a lot of money to fight them. Okay, and their logic, it's very simple what their logic is. I'm a generic producer. What do I get by coming into the market and competing with Claritin? I have the right to be a, compete in a competitive market, just, you know, just like if I was selling, you know, this podium. You know, I'll make normal profits with these chairs. You know, I'll make normal profits. Pfizer, on the other hand, has monopoly profits. So they have a hugely disproportionate incentive to spend a lot of money on legal fees, hiring expensive lawyers to try and keep me out of that market because they're protecting a monopoly. I'm just protecting my right to be able to come in there and produce a competitive product. Okay, and they do it all the time, all the time. Any big drug, when it's about to come off patent, you'll see them come up with a thousand and one things that will try and extend their patent. If they could just extend it a month, that might be a hundred million bucks for them. So it's hugely valuable for them to do it, and they do it all the time. Okay, uh, that's my drug rant. Um, 
copyrights. Um, okay, logic of copyrights, again, it's, it's the same sort of thing as the logic of patents. The, the, the logic of copyrights is that, you know, in principle, we give you a limited period of uh, monopoly for a limited period of time to give you incentives for, you know, doing creative work, whether it's music, you know, recording music, writing a book. Um, newspapers are copyrighted, obviously. Um, movies, of course, are copyrighted. Um, so that's, that's the basic story. Now, the idea of limited period of time, uh, this has gotten to be kind of a joke. And when I say the Mickey Mouse law, literally some of you might have heard this, we, we keep extending the copyrights. And the really perverse thing about it is we extend them retroactively, um, which the reason why I say that's perverse is, you know, going forward, we could say, okay, we're going to give you a 100-year copyright, you know, so you'll have this copyright for 100 years after you do your work, actually after you die. It's the death of the author. So you'll have it for 100 years. Okay, well, that would give you an incentive that, you know, you'll have a chance to make a lot of money and your heirs will have a chance to make a lot of money. But if we do it retroactively, we apply it to works that were done before, you know, 1990, well, we can't change what anyone did in the past. So you're sort of hard-pressed to say, you know, what's the incentives, what's exactly the story as to why we would extend copyrights retroactively. You know, so copyright, I believe the term used to be 50 years. I think now we're up to 95. Someone else may have the number more. Okay. Okay, so copyrights used to be 28 and renewable, and now we're at 95 years. Okay, and, and so now we're and now we're at 95 years after the death of the author. Okay, well the reason why this is sometimes called the Mickey Mouse Act is because the big actor in this has been Disney, because Disney uh, keeps running up to the expiration of the copyright on Mickey Mouse. And every time it's about to expire, they run down to Congress and go, this would be a huge disaster for the nation if, you know, the copyright of Mickey Mouse expired, so they get it extended. I I'm not kidding you. I'm really not kidding you. That literally is true. Um, okay. Well, copyright may or may not have been a good idea, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, but it's obviously a very, very different situation today where you have the Internet. I mean, 20 years ago, we had Xerox machines, of course. We had printing presses, so you could you know, duplicate, we had uh, video machines, you know, so you could duplicate movies. So there was always the ability to make copies. But it has never been so easy as to make copies as when you have digital material that can be transferred over the Internet. Okay, so we now have a whole new problem when we have copyrights, trying to enforce copyrights in, in the Internet age where we have um, the possibility of making, making duplicates, making copies. In fact, zero cost instantly anywhere in the world. And that, that's just going to get larger as we, you know, as the Internet gets more developed, gets quicker. Um, you know, again, already we could transfer printed material. I could transfer a book in a second, you know, with you know, broadband connection. But, you know, it's going to get to be the case that it will be just as easy to do that with, you know, music. It's already fairly easy, but, you know, with a movie, you know. So it gets to be a bigger and bigger problem. Okay, so, so how do we deal with this? Well, we deal with this by, you know, going through this sort of, you know, uh, escalation process where we develop more and better techniques to try and make it difficult or impossible for people to, to, to copy things. So we have software locks, and you have a lot of smart people who design software locks, and you have a lot of smart people who figure out ways around software locks. Okay, so, you know, but, you know, we have uh, innovative methods. Some of you might have heard about how Sony on uh, some of their uh, recorded material, they they put in a, a, I don't know if you call it a worm, but, you know, it's something that actually go on your hard drive and make it impossible for you to duplicate their, 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 their material using, using uh, your computer. Um, they since have retracted that because a lot of people got really pissed and it wasn't clear that that was even a legal thing to do. But that's, you know, that's what you do to try and protect copyrights. Um, that, that's why I was considering, oh, spyware, look on people's computer, do you have, you know, material that you don't have, you haven't, you aren't authorized to have. Uh, propaganda classes, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a real effort that the government is now trying to promote. I think that we're you know, all going to be singing song soon about how copyright is, is, is great, you know, because they're trying to convince people it's a moral bad to, 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 to violate copyright. And I, I think of this, I mean, you know, the analogy here is, you know, in the Soviet Union, you had, you know, rigid controls on markets. It was illegal to sell blue jeans, you know, right? You, you know, you had people sell blue jeans in the street. There's a black market in blue jeans. Well, that was against the law, and I'm sure that the government had, you know, they told people, you know, you're a really bad person if you're selling or buying blue jeans on the black market. Well, this is the same sort of thing with copyrights. You're a really bad person, you know, if you're copying music or movies or whatever, and you don't have authorization. I mean, I don't care whether you think people are good or bad, but that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to convince people that it's this moral bad if you, if you do these things. So, again, it, it points to me 
that, you know, we're looking at a situation where copyrights are just getting more and more unenforceable. Okay, the last point here, international enforcement problems. It, it strikes me as unbelievable that, you know, a main topic in trade negotiations right now is how we could get developing nations to honor our copyrights and software. And it's really, really pernicious. Actually, I should go beyond copyrights and software. Patents and prescription drugs. I mean, what we're, we're, you know, much of our, our trade negotiations with the Free Trade of America's agreement, much of that is about getting, forcing countries in Latin America, which are all obviously much, much poorer in the United States, make them pay patent protected prices for prescription drugs. Okay, that's, you know, what we're trying to do, which, you know, to my mind is rather pernicious, but in any case, just apart from whether we think it's pernicious or not, it's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of political problems, there's a lot of practical problems with it. And to date, at least, we haven't been that successful in many cases, uh, at least according to the government. Uh, I think they say China um, uh, has somewhere in the order of $100 billion a year worth of what they'll call pirated uh, software and um, music and video. I, I don't buy that number, but in any case, I'll grant that I'm sure it's a high number. Okay, what are alternatives? Um, and I'll start by talking about drugs, because um, again, the whole point here, this is one way of doing it, and if there is no alternative method, and you know, if you listen to, to the pharmaceutical industry, if you listen to the entertainment industry or software industry, they just throw up their arms, well, no one would ever do it if you didn't, you know, didn't have copyrights, didn't have patents. Well, I'll grant, you know, people have to be paid, they have to be compensated. So one alternative is, is something we've done some work on uh, with uh, Congressman Kucinich's office, the Free Market Drug Act. He actually proposed this last year, not that he's gotten 260 people to sign or anything. It's some number of co-sponsors. But this is one alternative. Okay, what does it do? Well, one thing to start from is that we're already spending, because I start saying, well, could the government just fund the research? And immediately people jump on you, oh, you want the government to do it. They can't even deliver the mail. I go, well, actually, we're already doing it, $30 billion a year, National Institutes of Health. Okay, most of it for more basic research, but sometimes they actually do clinical tests. There are some drugs. Most of you have heard of ACT. That was developed through NIH. They didn't develop it as an A drug. They developed it as a cancer drug. But they have actually had some major breakthroughs in actually bringing drugs through the process. Taxol, the most important, uh, um, most important uh, cancer drug, was developed largely through NIH. So there are cases where they didn't just do basic research. They brought the drugs to the market. But the industry actually goes to Congress every year and says, you know, this is great. You know, very efficient, you know, NIH does great work, give them more money. Okay, so the industry can't tell us that they can't think the government, they think the government can't possibly do anything because they've been telling us to spend more. It's better to spend the money on NIH than spend it on, you know, feeding kids or education. The money is better, they've been telling members of Congress it's better to spend it on NIH because they do such great stuff with it. Now, at the moment, they're very happy to have NIH spend lots of money because they just go in there and get the patents and make lots of money on it. But they can't given what they've been lobbying for for the last two decades, they can't turn around and say the government's such a bunch of buffoons, they can't possibly fund it. So what do they say? What they, ha what they have to say is, well, they can do basic research, but when you actually talk about developing a drug, then they become buffoons. Okay, and they do say that. That's, that. that's what they say. Okay, so what does the Free Market Drug Act propose to do? Um, it says, all right, we're spending $30 billion a year on basic research. Let's spend another $30 billion. I'm not sure that that's the number in there, by the way, but, you know, it doesn't matter. Let's say we spend another $30 billion and we take that $30 billion, take, create 10 competitive corporations and give them $3 billion each, and they're charged with actually developing new drugs. Okay, so they're charged with doing what Pfizer does or Merck. You know, so they're actually told to go out and develop new drugs. Okay, what are the rules? Okay, all their findings are placed in the public domain. Okay, so they go out and they patent something that's placed in public domain. Okay, so it means it can be produced as generic. So they come out with a new drug for treating cancer, AIDS, whatever it might be, heart disease. It's out there as a generic. Anyone who wants it can produce it just like anyone wants to make chairs can make chairs. Um, all results are published quickly. They're made publicly available. Everything's up on the web. So if you're working on some new process and you might have a breakthrough, you put it on the web. You know, we don't want anyone to not get credit. You know, you have it signed. It's on the web. Everyone knows who did it, so you get your credit. Okay, but it's available, so I'm working across the country, around the world, and I realize, hey, that goes along with something I'm doing. You can build on that. Okay, so all the research is public. We don't have the secrecy issue. It's part of the, part of the conditions. Okay, we have a billion-dollar-a-year prize to reward outstanding breakthroughs. Okay, we don't, you know, believe in giving people incentives. You know, it's not you're trying to stiff the scientists that do great work. You want, you want them to be compensated. Think of the Nobel Prize. It's like the Nobel Prize, but multiply it by 50 or 100 because, you know, maybe someone who has a really great breakthrough, it's going to extend the life of cancer victims by, you know, 20 years or whatever. 
give that person twenty million. You know, great. You know, and other people they have important innovations. Give them a hundred thousand, this and that. You have a lot of money to break up there. Okay, so it's the same principle. No reason not to reward people who've done impressive work, really impressive breakthroughs. Um, people are worried that I want to get rid of the patent system. Say no, 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 no. This is free market. If uh, Pfizer wants to go out and you know develop new drugs, and you know this is great because I've had some debates with people from the industry. They go, oh, it'll be a bunch of buffoons. You go, fine. Go out and keep doing. It. You know, if you think that this money's all going to be wasted, and you know the government's just throwing in the toilet, well, you just keep doing what you're doing then. It won't matter, right? You know, so if you're Pfizer or Merck and you, you just, you know, you go, well, this is really stupid. You know, the government just, they don't know how to do anything. Well, they shouldn't really be bothered. I mean, they'd be bothered like if we spent $30 billion in wasteful spending on the military or whatever, but it really shouldn't matter to them because what the hell do they care? They can't do anything. So if Pfizer thinks that it's all wasted, well, go ahead. Just develop your new cancer drug and you have nothing to worry about. Of course, the thing you might have to worry about is that it won't be wasted and they're going to produce new drugs that are as good or better than your drug and it's going to be available as a generic. So you're not going to get any money because no one's going to pay 10000 a year for your new drug when they can get the generic for 100 bucks a year. Okay, so this is totally a free market approach. Okay, money up front, after that it's free market. Okay, now I know to everyone this sounds kind of far-fetched, but I would just point out that the current path is far-fetched. I don't know anyone... You know, we're projected to spend $200 billion a year. The federal government is the we in that sentence. The federal government is projected to spend $200 billion a year on prescription drugs in 2014. And even when they do that, you know, the big reason this is jumping is the Medicare prescription drug benefit, seniors will be spending more on average out of their pocket on prescription drugs than they did back in 2000 when this was a big political issue. And that's adjusted for inflation, so I'm not playing phony numbers here, you know. So... We haven't dealt with the problem of seniors, obviously, who are the people who face the highest drug costs because, obviously, they have the most health problems. We haven't dealt with that with the Medicare prescription drug benefit, and we've given the government a huge bill that it's not clear how we're going to pay for. So whether that means we go the route of the Free Market Drug Act, I have no idea, but the one thing I could say is the current path is also ridiculous. I don't know anyone with a straight face who could tell me that we're both going to have seniors not getting the drugs that they need and also the government paying this huge tab at the same time for prescription drugs. And I'll just keep going like that. It doesn't make sense. Okay, but the main point here is that I think we, there are alternatives. We have to talk about them. Whether that's the best one or not, you know, we'll argue that. But that's one possible alternative. Okay, alternatives to software patents. Um, we proposed this, threw this out there. Uh, we have a paper opening doors and smashing windows. We don't believe in violence. Um, <laughs> You know, the basic story here, basically the same thing that you could do with, pre with prescription drugs, having publicly funded research, you could do the exact same thing with software research. And, you know, we did some very rough numbers. These are very crude numbers. But suppose you took $2 billion a year and you divided up, let's say, 10 companies. There's no magic to ten, number 10, but it's a convenient number. So you have 10 companies. Each gets $200 million a year to do software research. Same rules. Okay, so everything's in the public domain. All their stuff's done publicly. Um, and... Our estimate, again, a very crude estimate, could save roughly $30 billion a year in lower computer and software prices. Let me also throw in one other thing that I should have had with the prescription, the Free Market Drug Act. In order to prevent the perpetuation of sort of inefficient government bureaucracies, we have a clause in there that says that there will be periodic reviews. In the case of the Free Market Drug Act, there will be periodic reviews of these 10 you know, government corporations where the two least efficient would be dumped. So you'd have you know, a commission of public health experts and at 10-year intervals, they would evaluate the whole body of work that each of the 10 corporations have done, and they would decide who are the two least efficient, and they're out of business. Okay, so there's a strong incentive then for, you know, them to be run efficiently, and if they're not, they don't last. Okay, so whether those are the right numbers, 10 years, 10, 2 get thrown out, maybe it should be 3, maybe it should be 4, maybe it should be 8 years, you know, you could argue that one. But the point is it's easy to set up a system where you can ensure that you don't have inefficient bureaucracies perpetuating themselves indefinitely. Okay, and obviously, you could do the same sort of thing with software. Okay, uh, copyright support for textbooks. Um, you could do the same sort of thing. Um, again, uh, currently, we're spending about $12 billion a year in textbooks. Textbooks have the nice characteristic that, again, it can be transferred cautiously over the Internet. Um, the ballpark figure we came up with is if you, you spent around $300 million a year, you could probably finance an awful lot of textbook uh, production. And one of the things, that I, I say this as someone who's taught, that, you know, I don't know anyone who could say that 
you know, I got a textbook, and it's the perfect textbook that I want for teaching my class. I don't know any professor will ever tell you that. Even for true, they won't tell you that because they want to, you know, they have more self-respect and they're more egotistical. So they're going to say, well, this chapter's not good. So what can you do? Well, if you had, if you didn't have copyrights, I don't know anyone's ever going to sign their class two textbooks. Now, what you can do, and all of us have, all of us, many of us have done, is we put a copy, we Xerox copies, and made it available in a course pack. Well, you're not supposed to do that, but we do that. But suppose you could just freely mix and match. Well, I think most professors would say they would do much better in designing textbooks if they could just go through and take five chapters from this one, ten from that one, one from this, and one from that. That would give you a better textbook. So not only do you save a lot of money, you get better textbooks. Okay. And, again, no reason, you know, if someone wants to compete, free to compete. If, you know, the government corporations are buffoons and every textbook they produce is going to be a piece of garbage or, you know, whatever you think is going to be the problem with it, fine. You know, uh, Prentice Hall, whoever, they'll just go ahead and keep going. They'll be completely unaffected, right, because no one's going to want to buy the garbage textbooks that the government system's producing. So, you know, they just don't, you know, none of us want to see government waste, but it shouldn't affect them. Okay, um, artistic uh, freedom vouchers. I'll, I'll just go through this quickly because I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. Um, this is, again, just a different sort of system. You know, suppose we were to say, can we have something, uh, something other than copyright to support music, artistic work? The big issue here that anyone would rightly say, we don't want the czar of culture to tell us, you know, which artist, you know, do we like rap music, do we like rock music, do you like... Uh, mystery novels. None of us want that. I don't want it. At least maybe you do. I don't know. But you know, I think it's fair to say we don't want that. So can you think of an alternative that still leads the choice of the individual? So we came up with the idea of an artistic freedom voucher. Suppose you know we all. This is very similar to charitable tax deduction, except this would be a, a credit in effect. So pick the number, 75 bucks. Could make it higher. Could make it lower. Where you get to give it to anyone you like or an intermediary. And what do they have to do? They have to register, just like, you know, CEPR's registered as a 501c3, or if you're a church, you register to get tax exempt contributions, you register. The government doesn't decide whether they like CEPR or whether they like the Catholic Church. They just say, okay, it's a church, it's a CEPR, you know, a research institute, whatever. End of story. So as long as they don't find we're running a business, um, you know, making shirts and making a profit off of it, we're not lying about that, that's fine. They don't evaluate you know, whether Seeper's doing good work or bad work, or it's a good church or bad church. They don't decide whether, you know, you're making good music or writing good books. If people want to contribute the money to you, end of story. Okay, condition is that it's in the public domain. Okay, so if I'm getting money through the artistic freedom voucher system, everything I write's in the public domain. Okay, and the logic here is you get a subsidy once, you don't get it twice. Copyright's a subsidy. Okay, government's going to give me a monopoly. They're going to arrest people who, who make copies of my work. That's one thing you have the right to get. Alternatively, you have the right to get money through the artistic freedom voucher system. Okay, so I could be on one or the other. I can't be on both. Very simple. Okay, and numbers, just very rough numbers. If you had $75 per person, you could support 300,000 musicians, writers, actors, whatever, at 50000 a year. So that, that could produce a vast amount of artistic creative work that way. Okay, so again, we can think of alternatives. It's not terribly complex bureaucratically. It could all be done very easily on the tax code. And it doesn't involve the government with a heavy hand deciding what's good, what's bad, no more so than you could say the government decides what churches people should go to because we have a tax exemption. Same, same sort of thing. Okay, to conclude, um, just how we think about this, they are forms of government intervention. Okay, you know, when someone goes on about how they really support the free market, they really support free trade, well, if they're honest, or at least if they know what they're talking about, they must not support patents and copyrights, because those are forms of government intervention. Okay, to my mind, it doesn't make them bad, it's just saying what they are. Okay, so, you know, they're forms of government intervention. Um, there are enormous inefficiencies associated with them. Okay, um, you know, the high price of prescription drugs, the um, high price of copyright protected software. They also include, encourage antisocial behavior, rent-seeking, you know, making copycat drugs when Microsoft is trying to, you know, arrest everyone for making copies of Windows or, you know, Sony is putting spyware on people's uh, hard drives. These are all things that wouldn't make sense if you didn't have copyrights and patents. Okay, so they encourage antisocial behavior. And again, they're alternatives. So it's not that we don't recognize it's important to provide incentives. The big question is, are these the best way to do it? Okay, and that's what we have to have a debate over. Okay, so I'll stop, uh, take uh, five minutes for a break, and questions. <laughs>